Hello and good afternoon uh, to those in the room. Can those on the phone, everyone hear me okay? Is that an acknowledgement out there anyway? Yeah, the phone yeah. sounds good. Great, thank you. Uh, and now I'll ask that if you could uh, kindly go on mute too for those that are on the phone, that way we'll keep away the background noise. And I think we're gonna jump into it right away. This is our first quarter 2019 town hall for our newly consolidated shared services group. And thanks for taking the time to uh, come and join. We've got um, a big agenda. I'm gonna wait to cover that because our first guest is, uh, we're, we're fortunate enough to have Carrie Holly come and talk with us. And Carrie's a technical fellow here with us at Optum, formerly with IBM. So we've got a lot of industry experience and experience with artificial intelligence. And he's gonna take us through uh, some material that he and the team have been working on. He leads the ATC group. So I'd rather uh, deal with our dis uh, administration and our agenda later and get things rolling with Carrie. And then uh, as time allows, as he finishes, we'll try and take a opportunity for questions if folks have some, and then we'll get into the rest of our agenda. Okay, awesome. <coughs> so away, I'm gonna do a uh, fire storm of content. And if I'm going too fast or too slow, just stop me. And if there's anything you don't understand, uh, stop me and just raise your hand. Uh, I'll look for uh, signs of your faces as well. So uh, just, a, just a quick background on myself. I uh, spent the bulk of my career at IBM as an IBM fellow. I, uh, the audio like, is not good now. Is it my voice you're not hearing? Yeah, it's kind of in and out. That I don't know why. Um, how's my voice now? It's, oh, maybe that's it. On the t-shirt, maybe, or zip a little tighter on there. Okay, I'm gonna have to. <laughs> you gotta put your clothes on your body. Apparently. <laughs> How is the quality now? It's pointing down, right? It's gotta be down versus? No, you're, you're pointing down inside your shirt. We're gonna hear your heartbeat. Oh, <laughs> How's the quality now? <laughs> Much better. Much better. <laughs> Well, we've got a mic if you want to use that. Let me use the mic. Okay. This uh, hard <laughs> okay, quality's good now? Okay, so just very quickly, my background has been uh, with technology companies. I left IBM, joined Cisco, where I was a CTO um, responsible for an analytics portfolio. Uh, one of the things I, I'm most happy about is the work I did with the IBM in Jeopardy, and um, uh, did a lot of stuff uh, post uh, that event on ABC News and on uh, a TED Talk that we did. And I'm gonna dump a lot of content on you, but let me give you some hypothesis which launched the basis of this study. So how many show of hands have heard of the Academy of Technology? Excellent, it's only 10%, but that's a start. So we did launch something here called an Academy of Technology, which is an attempt, a initiative, to help with our cultural transformation to a tech, to a health technology company. The purpose of the academy is to identify and house our top 300 technologists across the family of UHG. And we had our first meeting in September where we launched studies. One of the studies that we launched is the impact of AI on Optum. So hypothesis, AI will be as important as the computer itself. Hypothesis, AI will disrupt every industry and cause some companies to become irrelevant or less relevant, shall we say. So that's the hypothesis of the study. So let's just jump into it uh, with the next slide. So the next slide identifies artificial intelligence as a general purpose technology. If that's a term you haven't heard, Simply what it means is that a general purpose technology, the computer itself is an example of a GPT, a general purpose technology. It's embedded in everything we do in life, in work, play, everything. In fact, you don't think twice about the embeddedness of computers. They're in your cars, they're in your phones. Every system we build, I argue, maybe there's exceptions, uses computer technology. Fair statement? Mm -hmm. I am asserting that the same will be true with artificial intelligence. I'm asserting that all of the individuals who think this is the next shiny object, I'm gonna give you a lesson, a real case study of others who have fought the same thing and have become irrelevant in the industry as a result. And I am suggesting that, which is now stated on this slide, is that this is either an existential threat to UHG 
or it's an opportunity for transformation. That is the bold statement that I'm making, and I'm saying it's black and white. There is no in-between. We will become less relevant, or we will become a powerhouse. And artificial intelligence is a game changer. What is the evidence of that in the marketplace? Is that someone singing? <laughs> <laughs> The evidence For those of that, on the phone, please put your phones on mute. The evidence of that is overwhelming. We have governments like China. Uh, we have even our U.S. president. We have DARPA. Uh, just, just tons of, of evidence of a heavy focus on artificial intelligence. Let me just give you a, a, a history lesson. And, and I, gave you, I could spend an hour on this slide, but I'm going to spend just a few minutes. Each of these represents a arrival of a general purpose technology. With each arrival, we have seen the decline of industry leaders. In the case of the computer itself, which I didn't inventory, and the PC, we saw the decline of companies like Burroughs, Honeywell. Do you even know what Honeywell does today? They don't make computers. But the point is we saw these companies evaporate. We saw other companies like IBM go through a death spiral, recover. Then we saw the same with the internet. We saw commerce powerhouses like Best Buy, Target decline. We saw some become less relevant than they are today. And then, of course, with mobile and cloud, we saw again the turn of the crank with a company like IBM becoming less relevant. A powerhouse who a decade ago arguably was a very relevant IT company. But I would venture to say, those of you who have children, who are teenagers or older, they probably won't list IBM as one of the top technology companies. They will list FAMGA, the Facebook, the Apple. But there's another subtlety here that is important to understand, and this is the next hypothesis. We will not be saved by technology companies. We will not be able to buy technology as we did a decade ago. The best technology, the coolest technology, stated more precisely, technology that can make a difference in business <coughs> is not being democratized. It's not being mainstream. It is not for sale. If you want to have access to that technology, you must do it by onboarding to a ramp that we call the cloud. And the examples of that are Google's uh, TPUs. How many of you have heard of Fei-Fei Li? Fei-Fei Li is a renowned computer scientist. She's a professor at Stanford. And prior to her uh, now rejoining Stanford, she was leading Google's cloud as their chief scientist, chief technologist. We've met with her a couple of times. I met with her, I live in, uh, in Silicon Valley in California. I met with her uh, two days ago, or was it yesterday? Was it yesterday? It was yesterday, <laughs> sorry. So we met with Fei Fei and I just, uh, I reviewed my hypothesis with her. I said, and she, she nodded affirmatively, but if you don't know, Fei-Fei Li was the principal investigator for ImageNet. It is because of people like Fei-Fei Li that we have facial recognition today. It is the work that she did that really arguably launched the spring of AI, which we're in right now. But you have her, and I could get uh, spend hours on this one as well, affirming that, no, Google is not going to democratize AI. Microsoft is not going to. I be, none of these guys, they're not going to mainstream this technology. They're going to make it available to us on an as-needed basis. In some cases, we can look at graph technology as an example. Graph technology has only been exposed to us, and by the way, it's been available to Amazon since its inception when they invented it, but it's only been exposed to us when people have left Amazon and formed startups. It's only that exposure that makes us available of the power of this technology to actually change how we think about our customers and the relationships and actually knowing our customers. Powerful technology that sits behind the scenes. So my point is that there's a lot of people in this company who believe that they're just going to be able to buy this technology. But what is happening is we look at Google and we say, you know, it looks like they're throwing darts against the dartboard. But instead, what it represents is an asymmetrical assault. So just like a terrorist 
and I'm not calling Google a terrorist. But just like a terrorist spawns multiple attacks and sees where vulnerabilities lie, where opportunities lie, that's what FAMGA does. They're all, it is a strategy, it's a working strategy. It's an asymmetrical assault to determine where can I grow, where is the opportunities, and technology is the basis for this. So, last point about this slide. Workloads, architectures, business models have all changed with each of these general purpose technologies. Next slide, please. It is definitely slow. Okay. Um, I think the next slide is describing this concept of AI winters. Uh, just keep uh, pinging and I'll just stop at the very end. I just wanted you to get a perspective of how I'm defining AI so that we can be on the same page. So the industry has not marshaled, has not convalesced, is those the right words? They, the, the definitions of AI will depend upon who you talk to. But at the end of the day, AI is a field of computer science. No one can debate that. If we look at the Russian nesting doll as an example, we can look at AI as a Russian nesting doll. It is the Russian nesting doll. When we take back the layers, we get something called machine learning. We take back another DAO, we get deep learning. We take back another DAO, we may get uh, natural language processing. And each of these is a field of study in its own right. But the point is that 20 years ago, there were a bunch of really smart mathematicians, computer scientists, and physicists who couldn't find work. And they couldn't find work because they were spending all of their energy on this thing called neural networks. And to be honest, to run one of these uh, complex neural networks took years, months, and it's, it just wasn't practical. And then suddenly the arrival of a mother load of data from the internet and from just the explosion and population growth, and then a, a, a little known company who built gaming graphical cards, graphical processing, you mean graphic cards for gamers, which were basically CPUs designed to do massive linear processing in parallel so that you could suddenly run these neural networks in minutes, days, minutes, hours, and days versus months and years. And suddenly those nerds became in high demand, of which they still are. And I don't mean to insult any of them because I've got one sitting to my left here who is uh, very talented in this, uh, this space as well. But the, the point is that we have the arrival of computing power called GPUs. We have a mother load of data brought about by the internet and other factors that allows us to do something called deep learning that we couldn't do before. It has caused the spring of AI, which I'm calling wave two. So let's do a quick history lesson of this company. This company, um, like all companies, were very big in wave zero. Wave zero were decision support systems. It was software engineering, handcrafted, rules-based systems. That's wave zero of AI. I call it wave zero because no one today would describe that as wave or as AI at all. But I call it wave zero because that's what, in the 50s and 60s and 70s, when we started building these systems, we called it AI when we did this decision support stuff. Then came wave one. Wave one was we really realized that math was useful again. Linear algebra was, 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 was cool again. Uh, statistics was good. And we, bit, we, we bundled those with, uh, uh, with computer science. And suddenly, we've got uh, prediction models that you see at play at our company today. So you see prediction models around opioids. You see prediction models around diabetes. Just a bunch of good stuff that we've done. So we are a company that is further along than others because we're very good at wave one. We've got lots of good analytics based on machine learning. We've got a lot of great data scientists in the company. And we also have a lot of this handcrafted wave zero stuff. So we got both. So far so good? First exercise I did in the company with my team, Julie being a part of that team. We sat down with NVIDIA. NVIDIA has been voted the smartest company in the world. Uh, because of the work they do in creating GPUs and in software. We sat down with NVIDIA and we, we did an exercise to prove that we could do better than wave one. Noticeably better. That 
if we introduce wave two into this company, we could build better prediction models and even more stuff that we can do. And so we proved that we could do that. I don't remember the numbers, 89 to 95? Yeah, something like that. Yes. So it, 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 that sounds like a small percentage difference, but when you're talking about a population that we're looking at, that's an enormous improved accuracy of your prediction model that we can do with deep learning. So we, we did that by building an infrastructure you and I, as, 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 as computer people, take for granted that, that we can use GP, uh, CPUs. Well, GPUs are not as easy to use, so we had to build uh, capability to make the GPUs accessible to the uh, people within the company at large. So that's the work that my team did. But some people will argue that the AI winter is coming soon. And they argue that because of the following. They will say that a trough of disillusionment, as noted by Gardner, is on the horizon. And by the way, they are correct. I am seeing the trough of disillusionment already with doctors because they've seen so many shiny objects, but I will flat out say they are wrong. Yes, the trough of disillusionment is coming, but there is no AI winter coming. And we see evidence that we know that that's true. We know that China, which has no limitations around privacy, no limitations around security, no limitations around imminent domain. We know that their ability to change this landscape is happening as we speak. We know, in fact, that they're ahead of us in the field of AI. We know that Russia has seen this as, I mean, I could go on and on about nations that see the importance of this as a game changer. We know that our competition, our future present competition, the announcement of Hayden, all of this is a at the end of the day, they will use AI to fundamentally disrupt. And they won't, AI is not the end game. AI is nothing more than like a computer. It's a general purpose technology that will be used to change the game. So that's the, that's the larger message I wanted to, to leave you with. And so within our organization, as with the industry at large, people will start describing, I'm doing AI, I'm doing AI, until you peel back the onion and ask the questions, well, what are you doing? Are you doing this? Are you doing this? And I'm suggesting, no, no, no. Let's focus on the wave two. And there's more invention on the way. And if we don't master wave two, we won't be prepared to that new invention. Next slide, please. So we made some conclusions around this study. We believe that our data, although a competitive advantage today, will not be a sustainable competitive advantage for a number of reasons. We believe that others will start collecting massive amount of data. We think the fact that we do not have a maturity in our data usage in terms of the virtuous data cycle will be a impediment to knowing our customer. We believe that there are other threats imminent. One of them is called small data. So you may have all heard that deep learning has a huge appetite for data. The more data, the more we can train, the more we can predict better prediction models. But we're doing a partnership with a company called Health at Scale, small company in Silicon Valley. This small company has uh, some outstanding computer science. I think they're less than 10 people, by the way. But they do network steerage. They do network steerage with small data sets using machine learning. So small data sets mean that maybe there's only 10 providers, maybe it's only cardiovascular conditions, but I know that I can create better outcomes for you if I steer you to this provider versus that other provider. I'm not using big data. I'm using small data. Synthetic data is on the rise. Synthetic data is the ability to use AI to create our claims data. That is probably five years away, but I'm, I'm looking at a 10-year horizon here. I'm saying that if we don't act now, in 10 years, we will see relevancy lost, and it cannot be reclaimed. Next slide, please. I'm sorry. Uh, last point on this last slide. Again, I could spend hours on all of these topics. Platform thinking is a business model change of the FAMGAs. And I hope you know the term FAMGAs, Facebook, Apple, Microsoft, boom, 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 or the three A's that some people like to use. Why do I say the cloud is a Trojan horse? I say the cloud is a Trojan horse because, and by the way, this is not a statement that we should not be adopting cloud. This is not a statement that we shouldn't be using Azure. This is not, a, it's not any of those statements. I am simply saying that there is some technology that we use that's cloud-based 
let's take Alexa as an example. So Alexa, um, Amazon just filed the patent, I don't know, a month ago, two months ago, on every time you sneeze or cough. Well, why would they file such a patent? One can only assume it's because of something related to healthcare. One can only assume that it's listening all the time. One can only assume that it intends to take action with that listening. I think those are fair assumptions. And if I add on to that, let's take Google. Google with AlphaGo did something that we didn't ever think was possible to beat the best Go players four out of five times. They did it with a compliment or an alternative technology to GPUs called TPUs. But I can't buy a TPU. The only way I get access to a TPU is to use Google's cloud. Let's assume for the moment that building one of these neural networks, I might train it, I might tune it, and maybe I get it just right five years later. But it took me five years to get it just right. It was getting me value every year, but on the fifth year, boom, it, it's really at its optimum state. I think I can protect myself through a contract? A legal entity? Well, I can sign as many contracts as I want with Amazon, but at the end of the day, I got to allow them to do SLA, service level agreements. And if I allow them to do SLA, I got to allow them to inspect. And if I allow them to inspect, I allow them to re-engineer anything I built. That's the Trojan horse. It is the new, by the way, we see examples of this with Netflix. We see that Amazon learned about Netflix by Netflix adopting the Google or the Amazon cloud. We know that Amazon is a predator. There's a tremendous amount of evidence that supports that. Next slide, please. Our technical debt is a problem. It's growing and we gotta get it under control. We've got to do, you know, no problem with acquisitions, but we've gotta manage those acquisitions in a better way. I would assert, and when I presented this to Cheryl Skolnick, who reports to Andrew Whitty, she said, well, Carrie, I don't know if that statement is true that you just made, which was none of our future competitors are incurring technical debt. Not a single one of them are buying legacy companies. So I don't see a future where FAMGA buys Aetna, CVS, or any of those companies. And I don't see that future because they do not want to be burdened. It's like, it's like you and I taking on someone else's credit card debt. They do not want to be burdened with that. They would rather reinvent and do that through technology. Our innovations today are silo and fragmented and we gotta do better. Next slide. So I think I've covered this slide and again, I, I hope what you see is that there's two points I wanna make here. I don't think that the FAMGA's intentions for healthcare are just because of the money, just because of the trillions of dollars available. I actually think they wanna do good. Let's take Facebook as an example. Facebook's reputation is, is actually going through a challenge right now. So why do they hire a cardiologist? Why does a cardiologist work for Facebook? He works for Facebook. I talked to such a cardiologist. They work for, he works for Facebook because he's trying to do something at scale that he can't do as an individual physician. Why does Facebook want to hire a cardiologist? Because they actually do want to improve their brand. They want to be able to have you and I as Facebook users be able to see that there's other benefits going on here that are not profit-centric. Why does Amazon bring up Haven as a nonprofit? Because there's a bias in the American psychic, I would assert, that nonprofits somehow mean that people don't make money. <laughs> so my point is that there is an altruistic element here, I believe, where they are trying to make the system better. They are trying to make people healthier, just like we are. Next slide, please. We can look at AI in any of these three ways, and they're all good, but I'm asserting we must look at all three of them, not a singular one. So we must look on the right at the opportunity to transform in addition to better products and tools. Next slide, please. 
I've covered this already. This is our challenge. Existential threat, transformational opportunity. Let's walk through a case study. Next slide, please. Mickey Drexler, if you don't know the name, uh, famous CEO in the uh, American industry uh, in his work with uh, The Gap, his work with J. Crew, his departing remarks on retirement, I wish I had paid attention to the internet. Next slide, please. So let me give you a confidential, confidential in that it's not confidential that I'm at risk legally, but it's something we should keep in the room. So as I told you, I've worked for IBM for a number of years. In 2002, I was part of a study team as an IBM fellow. Uh, maybe I was a distinguished engineer, but whatever. As part of the study team, we worked on a study titled The Impact of Google to the IBM Company. So think about that. 16 years ago, Impact of Google to the IBM Company. Not a lot of data available in 2002, but we did a lot of forensics. We found out where their real estate acquisitions, their data centers, uh, was, we could tell they were building data centers because of the energy consumption, the amount of land they were buying, there were no people you know, working largely in these server farms. We didn't call it cloud at the time, we knew they were doing on-demand commuting, we knew they were building uh, their own technology stack, we knew they were not building servers from us, HP, uh, Sun, or others, they were building their own servers. We saw a new industry being born, and we told Sam Palmazano, who was our CEO at the time, we said that we believe that Google will be a competitive threat to the IBM company. They will threaten IBM's hardware business because they're building their own servers. They will threaten IBM's software business because they're building their own technology stack uh, to deal with the problem that we haven't dealt with. And they're building, or they're doing services as well. They're engaged with our same customers selling analytical services at the time. Sam said, well, wait a second. Where do they get their revenue? He already knew it was a rhetorical question. We said 97.x percent of the revenue comes from ad dollars. He said, they quack like a duck, they're a duck. Let's move on, this is an ad company. Fast forward to 2013. 2013, still with IBM, the company has still not adapted to that study. So it's a decade later, it's 11 years later, and the IBM company has still not responded. They lose a bid to the CIA because their cloud capability is inferior to a retailer called Amazon, or now AWS their cloud capability. So what did we do differently in 2013? January of 2013, I'm part of IBM Research. We go into Jenny's office and some of her direct reports, and now we do a new study. This study is a demo that we built in five days. We built a commerce application, selling of dresses, and what we did is we used seven public APIs. We used AWS, we used Google Analytics, we use Instagram as the product catalog, we use WordPress, boom, boom, boom. Jenny's reaction was, she was taken aback. And she said, well, why didn't you use our cloud? And we said, well, we only had five days, Jenny. Our cloud would have taken us about 35 days. Okay, and there's details of why. Okay, why didn't you use our analytics tool, Cognos? Well, Jenny, that tool is not available as software as a service. Again, 60 days. So you see the point, the, and the message we told Jenny is that our company is becoming irrelevant, that high schoolers could do what we just did. This was not rocket science. So as a result of those actions, in 2013, that company acquired SoftLayer. So think about this, you're already behind, and now you're buying a company to catch up and you're still number three with no evidence that you'll ever reach one or two. I could go on and on. Let's talk about YouTube quickly. YouTube in, and I know I'm running over, so I'll be just a few more minutes here. YouTube, when they first launched, before the acquisition by Google, sent out to bid their infrastructure build up. They got bids back, the lowest bid, the winning bid, you could say, was from Oracle for $500 million, a so half a billion dollars to build the infrastructure. They rejected that bid, and they did it themselves for $250 million. Why did they reject the bid? It wasn't because of price. It was because the bid didn't meet their requirements. None of the vendors in 2002, I think it was the day or year, none of those vendors, that included IBM, that included Sun, that included Microsoft, that included Oracle, go on down the list. Not a single technology company had the technology to support and build the YouTube infrastructure. They had to do it themselves. They had to invent this. 
That was the world a decade, 16 years ago, and it hasn't changed. Best, or next slide, please. I do recognize that these companies have a competitive advantage over us because of how Wall Street measures them. And that's an advantage. We, but you see what I said here. It's not our inability, it's our unwillingness to do the funding on these fronts that will stop us from taking a leadership role. Next slide, please. I don't think the end game is AI. I said that all along. The end game is not artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is just like the computer. I mean, of course, they're different. But it is fundamental. It is a general purpose technology. By the way, if I didn't define this earlier, a general purpose technology is not only defined by the fact that it's embedded in everything we do, but there's a tremendous amount of research that's focused on it, and it's a technology that gets better and better and better decade by decade. And that's what we're seeing with artificial intelligence. So the point here of this slide that you partially see is that we have three worlds. We have the world that you and I build of systems. We have a world that we live in that's a physical world. And of course, we're people. We are becoming more cyborg, whether it's through implants, wearables, um, the things we drive, the things we use. The world is becoming more instrumented and the power to do, next slide please, to do more ambient care, more virtual care is being made more and more possible. Next slide please. So this is where I think the end game is. So okay, with Monique, that, I'm sorry to interrupt here. It's almost impossible to hear on the phone line because of. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, questions. <laughs> yes. So multiple times you've talked about a company, and I'm just curious your take on this. Probably because I'm a. Um, but it's NVIDIA. And, and what's your take on the future of, of NVIDIA in general and their ability to innovate past GPUs? It's a great question, and it's a great question on multiple fronts. So you've got multiple companies with competing technology. We've got Google with TPUs. We've got Intel with FP, FPGA and Microsoft with FPGA. But to date, there is no evidence that they're outperforming Google's GPUs, which are getting better and better year by year. If we look at the model that NVIDIA purports, not purports, has, for example, they are giving us engineers for free. We've been working with their engineers for 24 months now. I don't have the same latitude with any of the other tech companies. To answer your question, we sat down with Jensen, who's the CEO of NVIDIA. I have interacted with quite a few CEOs in the course of my career. I have never met a CEO who could sit down, and I think you would attest, yeah. to get at the bits and bytes of how neural networks work. It's an extremely capable business and technical executive. My assessment is they've got a bright future, a very bright future. There is no evidence that I can see of them being disrupted over the next decade because their invention is operating at a, at a furious pace. They define themselves as a software company, not as a hardware company. And if you look at the talent that they are accumulating in terms of making neural networks democratize, I give them five, I give them gold stars. So I'm very bullish on the video. I was gonna, I was gonna say that, but I didn't want anyone to have their portfolio. <laughs> Thank you. We need a disclaimer with that. <laughs> Any other closing questions before I turn it back to Pat? Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Hi, this is Juan Brown. I would like to ask you a quick question with your expertise. Please. Um, what, what, is, what is your take on the uh, erosion of the basic health care uh, market share over the last month or so? Is this, um, what's your take on this? Is this being driven by the Amazon uh, conglomerate or is this because of uh, uh, one payer um, threat? 
I think uh, I, it's a great question that uh, John Satilli and I discussed literally two days ago. I think it's a combination of all of those things. I think it's a combination of the, um, the lawsuit that we lost. I think it's, uh, and that lawsuit tells one of two stories. Uh, David Smith, I think, was the, uh, the plaintiff, or defendant, I guess, we were the plaintiff. Uh, but, uh, you know, the fact that the court didn't see Amazon as a healthcare, uh, uh, I think gives the market concern. I think the, uh, some of this is just the normal ebb and flow uh, uh, so I actually think it's probably a good time to buy some uh, UHG stock and uh, wait until the next quarter. I don't know, but uh, don't take my stock if that's, that's not my specialty. <laughs> I appreciate, I appreciate your, uh, your candor. Is there a way I can reach you um, after the meeting? Uh, the answer is yes. I may be in meetings for the next few hours and on a plane shortly, but... Uh, 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 oh, talk to uh, my. Cell phone is on the public, not public, it's on the UHG network, and I, I do respond to text messages. Quickly, too. Okay.